So my name is Dr. Brian Ogle. Um, I am a, an associate professor at Beacon College, um, and I'm the lead faculty member for our anthrozoology program. Um, so our program really examines human-animal relationships. We look at how human-animal interactions occur. We also look at just the care and management of animals in a different life cycle. Um, my research focus is actually focused primarily on zoo and aquarium topics. Um, I, of my 34 years that I've been alive, um, I have spent 15 of them physically in a zoo, and when I haven't been in a zoo, I was either too young to be one or I've been you know, teaching in a classroom. Um, but zoos are kind of my soul and my existence of what I do. So I love zoos, so I also love um, having opportunities like this to, to get together um, and talk about fun zoo topics. Um, so we're gonna talk about one of the animals that um, I think are probably one of the most interesting um, to have a conversation about, particularly when we're talking about zoological management um, and even this perception we have of different zoo animals. Um, so part of my background, um, like I said, I've been involved in zoos for a while. I actually did a contract at the Smithsonian National Zoo at the Conservation Biology Institute. Um, if you've been around the Smithsonian, what? Dr. Yeah. Could you slow down? Yes, here? absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so like I was saying that one of my um, contracts I did was with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, uh, which is an offshoot of the National Zoo. Um, and so if you've spent any time at the National Zoo, you know that this is what you're gonna see, is you're gonna see black and white everywhere that you go. Uh, we refer to it as pandemonium. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was kind of where I started having fun with this topic. Uh, one of the zoos I worked at, uh, prior to going, uh, you know, leaving the Midwest, um, we were actually looking at getting pandas. So I also kind of know this uh, from a firsthand experience of going down the route of, do we want to get pandas, and then quickly backing out of that conversation. Um, so, what we're gonna take a look at is this adorable, fluffy, black and white animal. Um, very charismatic, very super cute. Uh, there's no denying that, right? Uh, actually, one of my favorite things, um, and I encourage you to do this if you've not done so already, um, is if you peruse social media, there are tons and tons of videos of pandas just falling out of things. Um, for whatever reason, when they get three feet off the ground, they just kind of lose all sense of orientation and they just tumble and fall and bounce and all sorts of things. Um, the Smithsonian Zoo actually just uh, posted a video montage yesterday of a series of, a, it was a good 45 minute second clip, or a 49, oh my gosh, 45 second clip um, of their pandas just falling out of trees all day long. Uh, so th that's what they're known for, right? They make good content. Um, but, there's some other things that go with them. And so one of the things I wanna talk about um, is how these animals can be problematic when we talk about them in a zoological institution, uh, but also how they're problematic within a societal kind of understanding of conservation as well too. So I'm gonna pose some different things um, and I'm gonna pose this kind of system of looking at a misconception of these animals and the truth of the animal or like what we typically think of with these animals and what is the real reality um, when we talk about pandas. Um, this guy up here uh, was taken, uh, this picture was, I actually took this picture at the Atlanta Zoo. Um, there are only three zoos in the United States um, that have pandas, and we'll talk about that um, here in a second. As we go along, um, you know, there, if you have questions, let me know. I'm, my students up here will tell you um, that I'm not used to talking just straight at you guys <laughs> for an amount of time. Um, I'm very interactive, I enjoy the dialogue. Um, so if something doesn't make sense or if you have questions, you're like, oh my gosh, can you go into this further? Let me know, I'm happy to do so. Uh, so when we talk about pandas, the first uh, kind of misconception that we have about these animals um, is that they're not a bear, right? Um, for a long time, that was even a misconception that was held not only um, by the general public, but the reason why it was held by the general public that they're not a bear is because scientists didn't agree that they were a bear either. Um, there were many things, and when we take a look at the classification of this animal, um, but for the long time, scientists used what features of an animal to uh, classify them? Do you guys know? How they give birth. How they give birth, absolutely, that's a big one. What's another one? what they eat, absolutely, and also just their physical appearance, right? Those were the kind of big three things, right? How do they make babies? What are they putting in their mouth? And then what do they look like? Um, so when you take a look at this animal and you take a look at their facial features, right? There's an animal that we have here in North America that looks very similar to that. What animal do you think looks similar to that? Not a black bear, actually. Not brown. So remove the bear-like features and just look at the coloration. Raccoons. Raccoons, yeah. So because of the fact that these animals had the black-tipped ears and they had the circles around their eyes, they were actually considered to be a raccoon for a really long time. Um, and they were actually grouped together in the raccoon family. 
obviously that created a whole spur of debate. I mean, you look at them, they look like a bear, <laughs> right? Um, but then everyone also started getting this debate that they don't eat like a bear, right? Um, so what are they? So one of the advents that really helped with the classification scheme of these animals is the advent of genetic testing and looking at the genetics and the um, kind of the evolutionary history of the animal from that perspective. And through that process, we did end up putting them in the Ursidae family, which is the bear family. Um, there are eight living species of bear currently, and the giant panda is one of them. What's interesting though, is that they are in their own genus, so when we kind of go down from the family level to the next level um, of what we have, of the eight species of bear, five of them belong into one genus together, and then the pandas are on their own, sun bears are on their own, and the sloth bears are on their own. Um, but they are a bear. Um, so from an anatomic standpoint, when you look at their skeleton, they are a bear. Um, behaviorally, for the most part, they're a bear. Um, and then even from a, the biochemical data, um, they are, the genetic markers are there, the evolutionary path is there, that they are a bear. Um, when we take a look at another animal though, so there's another animal called a red panda, or the fire fox, if you guys have seen them, they're very cute, also great for social media content. Um, my favorite video is one um, coming out from its night house and it sees a rock for the first time, freaks out over the rock. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to look it up on YouTube, it's super cute. Um, but those are true raccoons as well, right? So we do have a panda that belongs in the raccoon family, that is the red panda, and then we have our giant panda, or the bamboo bear, um, which is in the true bear family. And like I mentioned earlier, um, they're one of eight current bear species um, that exist on our planet. So common misconceptions that are not a bear, they are a bear. So when we talk about pandas as a bear, um, we have to kind of get a scope of how big they are. So here you can see the male um, from the Memphis Zoo in Tennessee. Uh, males weigh 200 pounds and they're about six feet long. To kind of put that into perspective, um, a full grown male panda is about the size of a Great Dane, right? So they're, they're large as far as an animal goes but they're not big from a bear standpoint, right? A lot of people have pictured them to be very large, kind of like a polar bear. Polar bears are the largest species of bear, so everything from that point gets smaller. Um, so roughly they're about here, um, and they're just kind of big fluffy bundles of black and white fur um, that weigh about 200 pounds. They're also very strong, by the way. Um, bears are mainly omnivores across the board. There are two exceptions that exist to that rule, though. The first one is that our polar bear, um, polar bears are what we call an obligate carnivore. So that term obligate means that they have to, right? So polar bears have to eat meat. Um, they will not survive if they don't eat meat. Um, a lot of people ask, well, why is that, right? So if we think about where polar bears originate from, there's not a lot of access to vegetation, right? They do live in the tundra on the ice sheets. When vegetation does become available, they will forage for different berries and fruits and different things like that, different herbs and shoots. Um, but a majority of their diet will be composed of meat. They are, they are carnivores by, like, through and through. On the flip side of that, we then have our friend the giant panda. Uh, and the giant panda is not an omnivore. <laughs> um, a majority of their diet, almost 98% of their diet, um, comes from uh, vegetation, right? Um, they eat around 26 to 84 pounds of food every single day. Um, and of that, that food, it's all bamboo. So they only eat one particular food item. So when we talk, so they will, yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into that. Um, so when we talk about this concept of them being a bear, um, well, let me, before I go into that next idea, let's, let's talk about this idea of their black and white pattern, because this will lead me into this next part of, of what I want to talk about. Um, they're infamous for their black and white pattern, right? That's one of the most easily recognizable animal patterns that exist out there. Um, what's interesting, is that this quote came from um, a researcher uh, who we'll look at their work here in a second, in which that virtually no other mammal has this appearance making any analogy difficult, right? For the longest time, scientists had no idea why these animals were black and white or why they were patterned in the fashion that they were, right? No other animal had this type of coloration. No other animal had the distinctive patterning that they had. So it didn't make any sense, right? We couldn't figure out, well, this makes sense because of this, because this other animal has that same type of patterning. They don't, there's no other animal that does that. Um, so they came up with a couple of hypotheses, right? So they came up with a couple of theories as to why. So one of them was actually centered around this idea of camouflage. So the first one was that it was a seasonal molt that got impacted by their diet. So that the, the general thought is because these are temperate animals that do live up high in the mountain range and they'll travel up and down the mountains, they'll migrate up and down the mountain sides to you know, stay within a certain climate condition. Um, and what they were thinking was that what ended up happening is that during the winter time, they'd be mostly white 
and then during the summertime they would be mostly black, and then eventually the two color patterns just kind of stuck with each other. Part of that kind of comes back to this diet, which this is gonna be a running theme here in a second, so I'm not gonna give too much away with that. The other idea is this idea of disruptive coloration. We see that with some of our birds here in, the, in our area, right? That they're actually, they don't blend in at all, right? We think about like our white great egrets, right? That's what we call disruptive coloration, in which that they actually have no reason to blend in with the natural environment. We think of like the big, beautiful, colorful macaws. That's disruptive co uh, coloration. They don't have to blend in because of where they live um, in the canopy. So they thought to a certain extent that might have been it as well. Um, and then they also thought about looking at the eyes, right? Why do they have those black circles around their eyes? And there's a lot of animals, the cheetahs in particular, cheetahs have those black tear lines that run down their face. Those actually serve as the same reason why um, athletes will put the black underneath their eyes to reduce the sun glare. Cheetahs have that same kind of purpose. Through testing, that doesn't happen with these animals either, right? So they're like, oh my gosh, like why do they have this? So the, the team that actually started looking into this and started evaluating why pandas have the coloration that they have is the exact same team of people who found out why zebras are actually brown and white. Um, do you guys know why zebras are patterned the way that they are? Pierre, are you gonna give it away? Um, it was, uh, they, they, did they do research where they painted a cow yeah. for the zebra patterns and they found that 80% less flies. Yeah, flies. as to prevent fly strikes. So zebras, for the long time, we thought zebras were, were patterned uh, the color where they, they were was to disrupt the, the uh, vision of predators so that they couldn't pick out who was who in the herd that was running. Um, and it turns out that's not true at all. It's actually to prevent fly strike, or from flies landing on the animals and biting them and actually having fly infestations. Um, so the team that found that out actually started looking into the panda, and they started figuring out like why. Like why does the panda look the way that they do? And essentially what they've come up with is that um, pandas are socially inept and that they have to be able to, when they're walking around the forest, quickly look at another thing and be like, ah, oh, that's a panda, <laughs> right? Uh, and so what they also think that ended up happening is it's a mixture of things that it started off as that seasonal moat of going from the white to the black and kind of going back and forth. And we see bears that will do that. There are bear species that will do that. But what ended up happening is that because of their diet, their body couldn't keep up with that. And so the two colors just stuck. And then it started evolving to become a communication pattern. So where that as pandas are moving through the forest, they can look down the hillside and be like, oh, there's another panda, right? They are solitary animals. They need a lot of social hope in that regard when they start interacting with each other. But they also have no natural predators. Um, so there's no need for them to actually have any form of camouflage either because the, the predation really doesn't occur for them. So when we talk about this idea of a panda, um, we think about that, yeah, they're a really good example of a bear, right? They're, they're, they've not, like, are locked into this niche. They're exploiting this habitat. They're doing some great things. The problem is that they're not very good bears. So <laughs> what we're going to look at is this idea that, yeah, they're a bear, but they're not a very good bear. Um, they spend 16 hours of their day eating. Uh, that's actually kind of the flip pattern of most bears in which they're actually going to spend a majority of their day sleeping and then saving up um, energy reserves. And they have to consume a large amount of food because bamboo is so nutrient poor that they can't actually function as a living thing. So when we talk about the reason why their black and white coat stuck is because their diet doesn't have enough like nutrients in it to support that much hair loss and regrowth that essentially their body kept the black and white pattern because that's all it could afford to do. Um, this, it gets better, just wait. <laughs> I promise you, it gets a lot more interesting. Um, What's even more fun is they're a bear, right? So they're fully designed like a bear. Most bears, like I said, are omnivores. And the, the most extreme on one end is the polar bear, which is mostly carnivorous. Everyone in the middle kind of splits it in different patterns, whether that's eating protein from insects or carrion, which is the dead kind of things that they can scavenge on. Um, there's a variety of things that they may come across. When we even look at like our black bears, that changes seasonally based off of what they have available to them. Um, and so, even when they're eating the vegetative kind of component, what they're going after are the different types of nuts, berries, the fresh shoots, things that are easy to digest that the body could break down. Because they are carnivores, so their body is not designed like a true herbivore, right? So their body is not designed to break down this high, you know, starchy vegetation. Um, but they also have a, a different microbiome, right? We know our omnivorous bears have a different microbiome in their gut to help process some of that food stuff compared to the more carnivorous bears. Pandas do not. 
um, pandas actually have the same microbiome as a full obligate carnivore. So, microbiome? so microbiome is going to be all of the bacteria, viruses, things that live in your gut. So when you think of like taking like um, yogurt to help with your digestive tract and keep it healthy, you're kind of flourishing that um, microbiome complex in you. So the microbiome is just basically your the ecosystem of all of the micro stuff that lives in you. So you know bacteria, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and it is important for us to have it because it's actually what helps break down our food and digest it and actually get all the most of our nutrients. Um, with these bears, though, <laughs> they have the microbiome of a carnivore and not of a herbivore at all. So their, their gut, like internal operations, has not changed despite the fact that these bears have been eating bamboo for a really long time. Um, that has not changed or altered in any capacity. Um, and as a result of that, they have to move around a lot to find bamboo because they can't eat the entire bamboo stalk. They have to eat the shoots and they have to eat the pulp within the middle of it. So they won't even eat the entire bamboo like stalk. Um, and so they have to move around a lot to be able to find the food that their body can digest and to get the actual nutrients that they need to survive. And as a result of that, they're the only temperate bear that also does not hibernate because they can't afford to hibernate. <laughs> so. Um, they also will poop 50 times a day uh, because they have an inability to digest the food that they're taking in. Um, so when we talk about them as a functional biological being, they're not great, <laughs> right? Like, like there's a lot of things that are really interesting that are happening with them. Where do they naturally live that they can access that kind of bamboo? Yeah, so they, li they live in China. They live in one particular area in the, uh, I think it's the northeastern range of China. Um, in the mountain range, and it's a, the mountain. The climate actually changes based off the season on the from the elevation. So from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain, and so the bamboo grows in like kind of almost like a ripple effect, going up the mountain and then coming back down again. So the bears migrate up and down the ridge of the mountain, following the bamboo. Yeah. Um, so as we continue on to talk about them as a bear, um, what's actually kind of cool about these animals is because they've eaten bamboo for so long they have actually adapted a special wrist bone that actually works more like a thumb, so they can actually grab things. Um, no other bear has that, which is interesting that they could evolve to do that, but they can't fix their microbiome in their, their stomach, <laughs> right? Um, they're also very largely solitary. Um, they don't do well with others. Um, they really don't um, tolerate each other in a, a, a good sense. Um, but they will communicate through different types of calls and scent marking, and then they will only meet up with each other um, during mating season and with their mating season, um, females are only able to conceive for two or three days out of the entire calendar year, right? So one of the reasons why they have to be able to look down the mountain and be like, oh, that's a panda, is because they have a very short amount of time to be able to find a mate and to be able to actually successfully reproduce. And the reason why they only have that short amount of time to reproduce is because it's the <laughs> lack of <laughs> <laughs> nutrients in their diet. Yeah, exactly. Um, and their, their body is actually so nutrient poor that they can't actually sustain a long preg pregnancy. So if you ever look at a panda cub when it's born, it's itty bitty. It's only about this big. And the reason for that is because it actually is more successful for the, for the offspring to actually be birthed early and try to develop outside of the mother than it is inside because the mother's body can't actually sustain enough like, you know, components to it to actually you know, carry the fetus all the way through fruition. So when they're born, they're essentially helpless. They really, they're not a functioning baby. They're not um, able to be really, they can't move around, anything along those lines. Um, they're a lot like a kangaroo. They're almost kind of borderline, um, resembling like a marsupial as far as how like just undeveloped they really are. Um, so conservation, right? So let's talk about this idea of conservation. So we have up here the IUCN's um, listing of conservation. So we have all the way down here, our least concern. These are the animals that we're not worried about. They're doing great all the way down to the fact that they're extinct in the wild, which means they can only be found in captivity or they're just completely extinct, right? If you had to make a guess, where do you think pandas fall on this spectrum? Endangered. endangered. Okay, so we have this idea of endangered. How many of you think might, they might be critically endangered? Critically endangered, okay. So let's talk about this. This is another misconception of these animals. They're the only bear species whose population is actually increasing. Um, and they're actually considered vulnerable. So they're not even along this whole endangerment route at all. Um, and we're gonna talk about this idea too, because this is also really super interesting. Every other bear species is actually kind of moving the other way and actually moving towards the endangerment and their populations are, are decreasing, not only in the wild, but also in captivity as well. Um, so according to the recent census that was done, um, there's a, roughly about 2,000 pandas. We think there's actually more than that that exists in the wild. 
Um, and there are 600 pandas that are found in captivity at this moment. Um, so here you can actually see um, the stats that exist um, from the, the census periods. Um, the real main census that kind of alerted that something might be wrong with the panda population is when they dip below 3,000, right? Um, they're a regional animal. They're, they're not widespread like a, a grizzly bear or a black bear or anything like that. So they're regionally um, specific. So you're not gonna see them in the high, you know, high levels. In the 1980s, they did dip low, um, and they almost made it to about 1,200. So there was a rapid decline that existed um, that there were some concerns. From that point, though, with a, just a little bit of protection and a little bit of work with them, their population rebounded really fast, right? That also tells you something about where these animals come from and the type of you know, conservation practices we see, because elephants don't look like this, right? Tigers don't look like this. So there's, there's a lot of things that are at play here. When we compare this to other bears, um, some bears, which is another regional bear, um, there's less than 700 of them left in the wild, um, and that's actually probably high, a high estimate. Um, there's about 22,000 polar bears left in the wild, and we have over 600,000 black bears that live in the United States um, in, in the North America region. When we look at captivity, there's less than 300 polar bears, and that number is going down every single year. It's actually really difficult to find polar bears in captivity now. Um, and so we see this opposite trend that's happening with other bears that we see with pandas. Um, their range is about 5,000 square miles, so it's roughly the size of Connecticut or Hawaii, right? And that's their normal historic range. So they're, again, they're a regional animal. They're not widespread by any means. Um, they're one of the few species that has a sustainable conservation site. So what we mean by the fact that they have a sustainable site is that the population is actually not fragmented, right? One of the biggest concerns that we have with many species that we're trying to work on, Florida panther is a great example, that these populations are isolated, they're cut off from each other, and they're small little pockets, and those pockets can't actually get to each other. So when those populations become entrapped in those areas, we start worrying about bottlenecking, meaning their genetic diversity goes really down, we start worrying about inbreeding, and we worry about successful generations um, from that point. Um, they don't have that concern. It's one of the few animals that we actually don't worry about fragmentation or having to build corridors for these animals. Um, the largest single subpopulation has 400 individuals within a single area, um, which is probably pretty impressive. Um, and their main threats are actually not what we think of when it comes to other endangered animals. The main thing is tourism. These animals are so popular to see with tourists that the fact that we want to see pandas because pandas are adorable and fluffy and they're super endangered is actually putting them more at risk than anything else. Um, logging is a little bit of a threat, but not in the way that we think it is. The logging is actually not to kind of go after the bamboo because the bamboo really isn't worthwhile, right? It's not like the hardwood forest that we want to go after or anything like that. It's actually more to clear land for agriculture um, and to be able to support agriculture development. And that's really probably going to be an upcreasing tick for them. But when you look at the actual conservation reports and the things that are coming out and the status updates on these animals, Recreation and tourism is really the number one thing that is really putting these animals in danger. Excuse me, but yeah. Them? yeah, so that's a great question. So tourism for wildlife is actually can be can be very harmful and very detrimental to them. So it's better than going and shooting them for sure, right? It's also arguably, you know, if you want to see elephants, it's better, you know, to go to Africa and see an elephant versus seeing an elephant in a zoo, right? We can make that argument. Um, the problem, though, is when you go to that area, you're actually going to disrupt their natural behavior. So you can, the roads to be able to access these animals actually can create disturbances. It can create you know, change in the patterns of how the bears are moving up and down through the mountain range. Um, noise levels have a big one, right? These animals don't like people. Um, so when they hear a lot of anthropogenic noise or a lot of human-generated noise, they move away from it. And so they actually start moving away from their normal kind of denning areas, away from um, where they would congregate together in different places. Um, and also, people don't always do what they're supposed to. There's a lot of pictures of people like chasing these animals to get pictures of them and things like that. So it, it really comes down to a disruption of natural behavior and just kind of an alteration of how they're using their physical space around them. Um, one of the things we know, just looking at North American wildlife, so coyotes, puma, badgers, deer, things along those lines, those animals, when they live in an urban environment compared to out in the middle of the country or a national park, they actually physically change when they're active compared to their other counterparts to avoid humans. So they'll actually physically structure their day to avoid when humans are gonna be around or when they know the humans are gonna be most active. We're starting to see similar things happening in Africa with like Kruger National Park and things along those lines too, that animals are altering the, how they're using the space and how they're using the area because such an influx of people coming into it that it's disruptive for them. Yeah, animals as a whole don't, don't like us. <laughs> they prefer not to be around us if they don't have to. 
Um, what we're talking about is a conservation symbol. Um, they are a cultural icon. Um, panda is, the panda is very, is very appreciated and very well respected, but it's also a sense of pride in the country of China. Um, and it's really believed that the reason why this looks the way it did is because the country of China rallied behind these animals as fast as they did, right? So they really put some work into like protecting those areas, making sure that people weren't going to bother those habitats, um, and really setting aside a lot of national park space um, for these animals to be able to survive and continue to thrive. Um, there are also what we call an umbrella species. This is really important compared to what we talk about, like with the keystone species. So a keystone species is an animal that if, that have, if it was removed from that ecosystem, the ecosystem would physically alter or potentially collapse, right? It would not be the same balance. It would not work in the same manner that it would. A keystone species that we have here in our area that we can see is the gopher tortoise, right? So our gopher tortoise actually creates burrows that is actually home to over 200 different species of animals, right? So they're incredibly important. They actually help alter the, the landscape. They help keep everything fresh and where they're going. So if we lose the gopher tortoise, we lose a whole other set of wildlife with them, right? So they're, they're a keystone species. Pandas, on the other hand, if they disappeared from the forest, nothing would happen, <laughs> right? Like, it really doesn't change. Um, they're what we call an umbrella species. So by protecting the panda, you're actually protecting the whole ecosystem, which allows other animals to thrive. So there are animals that live in the, the same region, in the same area as the panda, that are actually really endangered and that need our help. And through the conservation efforts to protect the panda, we're actually saving those animals and they're rebounding even more, right? Um, so it's still of great conservation value, but they're not what we'd actually classify as a true keystone animal. Part yep. of the entire ecosystem. Well, umbrella species just happens to protect the other species just because they're the ones being protected. Right, exactly. So think of it, so like with the keystone, so that comes from the term of when you were building a house, that was the middle support, right? So if you remove that, the house would not be as stable and could potentially collapse. With the umbrella, think about like the panda holding an umbrella and keeping its friends underneath the umbrella and keeping them out of the rain, right? So the, the panda is helping to protect the animal, other animals around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, pandas also bring sustainable economic benefits as well, um, especially to the local communities that support the tourists that go to see them. Um, so ecotourism and the investment into land trust is actually really important as far as an economic driver. Um, this is a general trend that we're trying to do with wildlife in general. Um, the manta ray is a great example. Um, the manta ray is a big, beautiful stingray. Um, it is you know, one animal that a lot of people like to go dive, go see, but they're heavily hunted as well. And so one of the things that they work with in those areas where these animals are heavily hunted is to demonstrate that these animals are actually worth more alive than they are dead um, and try to generate economic drivers to bring divers in, to bring in these different land trusts and different um, companies that, that really invest in that area because of the presence of the manta ray. And so it's really shifting the economic system to where we're relying on the animal being alive as opposed to the parts of the animal after the fact. It's also more, it's more of a sustainable income as well. Um, so Western conservation groups use the panda as a ploy to market, um, and this is an important thing as well. So how many of you guys have, are familiar with the, the large conservation organization that has the, the black and white panda as their logo, right? So this is actually a quote about that. So the World Wildlife Fund's founders were aware of a need for a strong, recognizable symbol that would overcome all language barriers, and they agreed that the big furry animal with her appealing black and white patched eyes would make an excellent choice. Essentially, the panda was picked to be a symbol of conservation because it was cheap to put on a postcard, oh. <laughs> right? Um, and that's really what it boiled down to, is that it was an easy graphic animal that didn't require a lot of color and a lot of like, kind of cost as far as the production of conservation marketing materials. Um, so was it because of the fact that this animal was critically endangered things were happening? They took advantage of that there was a slight decline in the population, capitalized on it, capitalized on the cuteness of the animal, and uh, went off from there. So then we have that idea of pandemonium, right? So we have used that term before. Does it translate into real conservation action, right? Is that a bad thing, right? If we're actually taking this animal, using it as a, as a symbol, but we're getting all these benefits out of it, is that a problem? The problem is that there's actually little evidence that suggests there is any real tangible outcome related to conservation, particularly in China, um, that's actually benefiting um, those ecosystems. So that's where it kind of comes into play. Other umbrella species do exist. Um, we also, we talk about that in conservation marketing a lot and talking about how we use cute cuddly animals to really sell and then be able to use that money not to protect those animals, but protect the animals that we're really trying to go after. 
reptiles are a big one, right? People will not fund reptile conservation efforts. People don't like reptiles. So instead, we use a cute, fuzzy little animal that that reptile eats to be able to save, and then therefore we're saving the actual animals we're trying to go after. Um, so it's all about marketing, right? Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that come with that, because we're going to talk about that here in a second with the, the zoo component. Um, so with our misconception that pandas are important to zoos, they are to a certain extent, but not the reason why we think they are. Um, so the common thing is when we talk about you know, the general public, if you were just going to have a conversation with somebody and you're like, this zoo has a panda, the first thought is like, whoa, like they must be a world-class zoo, right? Like that must be one of the best zoos. Um, in fact, only 25 zoos in 18 countries actually display these animals outside of China. Um, and we only have three in the United States. So we have the Smithsonian in DC, we have Zoo Atlanta up in Georgia, and then we have the Memphis Zoo in Tennessee. There used to be four. San Diego um, actually lost their pandas a couple years ago, um, and we'll talk about why they lost their pandas here in a second. Um, and so, and there's no plan that they're gonna be getting new ones either. So, and currently in the United States, there's no conversations being had um, of any other zoos bringing in pandas either. Um, it's just not a conversation that is really encouraged or um, for a while was allowed to be had. Um, and the reason for that is like there's this misconception that they're super easy to manage, and they are not. <laughs> um, there's actually little to show um, for the requirements to acquire them and to be as far as the investment that's being made, and I'll explain that here in a second. They're very expensive to feed. Again, they only eat specific types of bamboo, specific like you know growth periods of bamboo, and they have to eat a lot of it, right? And bamboo can be very pricey. Um, they're actually five times more expensive to feed than an elephant is. So just to kind of put that into perspective. Um, yeah. Um, pandas also do not equal sustained or larger crowds, right? So, and that's a big thing as far as when we're talking about the cost of this. Um, one of the things that zoos are trying to do is that, oh my gosh, we have these pandas. So everyone's gonna want to come to see the panda, right? So we're gonna have all this increase. And you're right, there's a giant increase in sales and ticket sales when your pandas come. And after year three, it bottoms back out to pre-panda level and people stop coming to see the pandas, right? And why do people stop coming to see pandas? Because they just sit and eat bamboo all day, <laughs> right? Like, and if you're fortunate enough to see them fall out a tree or do something like that, it's great. They make better for social media content and for webcams than they actually do for going out of your way to visit the, the panda at the zoo. Um, the other big reason is this, is that China holds all the cards. All this, all China, or oh my gosh, all pandas are actually the federal property of the state of China. Um, so there's no, like, it's not like when we look at like African elephants, for example, African elephants are owned by the individual zoo that is displaying them and they may trade them around or put them on loan for breeding purposes, things like that. The government in China owns all of these animals. So in order to do that, in order to get pandas, there's actually multiple things that have to happen. And that is a, a trade agreement that happens and a rental agreement that happens between the, the country of China, the individual zoo, and then you have a trade agreement between, if you're, it's here in the United States, between the government of China and the state in which the zoo is in, and then the country of China and the country of the United States. There's three levels of trade agreements that have to happen. The reason why San Diego lost their pandas was because of the trade war that existed during the Trump administration. Um, and so in which the China was finding ways to keep playing hardball and to keep pulling things back as, as these negotiations were going up and up and up is that that was kind of one of their playing cards that they had against the state of California is they're like, no more pandas for you. Um, and they pull their pandas away. Um, and they can do that at any point, especially when the lease of these animals are up. Um, and that's part reason why zoos are not pursuing pandas because that conversation was squashed real fast, that we're not to engage in those conversations or to uh, promote that. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, but when you look at the new trade agreements that are coming out, um, China also uses pandas as a political kind of nod and as a political message as well. Um, and so that's usually a demonstration if you're in good favor with China or not. Um, so because we were not in good favor with China, we lost our pandas. We originally got pandas for the first time in the United States because it was when the Nixon um, administration started actually approaching and having relations with China. That was the first gift to the United States from China was the pandas. Um, and then I, uh, there, there's new pandas going into Canada right now. There's two new pairs going to Canada um, in the next couple of years. And that's a result of a new trade agreement that happened. Um, and it was actually a political gesture on the end of China um, to be able to kind of reward um, uh, Canada for working and playing nicely with them. Um, same thing with Germany. Um, and so we see these different things that are happening with that. 
Um, when we talk about the true diet of pandas, and what we talk about from a stance of having them in captivity, particularly outside of China, um, the true panda diet is this, <laughs> really, at the end of the day. And it's not just because of the food that they eat. Um, when we look at the zoos that had these animals, so between DC, Atlanta, Memphis, and San Diego, in the four-year period that they were evaluating, it's believed that those four zoos actually lost $33 million in their investment in pandas. Um, so as a result, these zoos actually, as a collective, spent more money than they were ever bringing in. Um, part of that is that your first investment is the exhibit, right? Typically, a zoo animal exhibit is expensive. The, this is a base, you know, kind of bear model exhibit. Um, is about $15 million is what it's going to cost a zoo to build a new animal exhibit. Um, particularly one for pandas in which you have to, because these animals can't be worked free contact, I mean you can't be in the same space with them, so you have to have special holding areas, you have to have special equipment to keep the keepers separated from the animals, and because they're also solitary, you have to have multiple areas to have displayed multiple pandas and keep them separated and isolated from each other because they only come together for breeding and that's it. Um, it's usually estimated it's about $300,000 every year um, to feed these animals, um, is what we're looking at as far as bamboo operations go. Um, and then what it really comes down to, and this is the part that really gets a, you know, a lot of people kind of riled up, is that you don't, you're not gifted pandas, right? There's only one facility that's actually gifted pandas, and I think that's even stopped, and that's uh, the DC Zoo, right, as far as here in the United States. You actually rent them uh, from the, the country of China. You rent them you, for a 10-year lease, right, is essentially what you do is you sign a lease for these animals for 10 years, and you get a pair. You get a male and a female panda, and it's at the cost of a million dollars per year. Um, and that's the minimum cost. Um, the actual cost that Edinburgh is paying right now is $1.5 million a year for their animals. San Diego actually spent more on that because they can actually inflate that cost um, depending on how much they, they think that those bears are actually going to generate from people coming into the zoo. Is it 300000 per bear? Uh, total, for the pair. Okay. Yeah, for the pair, yep. And that's assuming you have a good, a good supplier and you don't have to import it. A lot of zoos can't actually grow bamboo on site or grow enough bamboo on site um, to sustain them, so they're actually bringing in bamboo from all over the continent, um, and they're having to work with multiple suppliers to be able to pull in all the different types of bamboo, and it has to be shipped at certain times and in certain methods um, to, to ensure that the bamboo is still nutrient-rich, but you're also not losing those shoots that they're wanting to go after, and the pulp doesn't degrade either. Um, so there's very specific ways that these have to be packaged, have to be refrigerated, have to be shipped, et cetera, so that way the, the bears will actually eat them. That's also assuming the bears are gonna eat every type of bamboo you give them. They are also very picky and they will easily just take a pile of bamboo and be like, not good enough, and then move on and try to find something else. It seems like a pain. It's a very big pain. Um, and then, so the whole idea, the reason why you get a male and a female bear is that the goal, um, as you spend your $10 million, or sorry, your, yeah, your $10 million to be able to rent the pairs, right, for the, for the period, um, is that you want to have babies, right? Like that's what's really going to draw on the public is that you want to have a baby, you're there for conservation efforts, et cetera. So if you have a baby, great, they slap a $400,000 price for on that baby. Um, and, then you, and then within a certain time period, so from the time of the birth until I think it's the age of four, you're allowed to have that animal, but ideally by the age of the time they're three, you ship them back to um, China. Um, and the, you don't get to retain that baby and the, you have no rights to that baby and you have to send them back by a certain point. Yeah, so let's talk about that, right? So this is where a lot of people were banking on like, okay, if I spend the money, if I invest the money on these animals and we're gonna have babies, right? So if I have a two year lease and we know that they're gonna breed probably every two to three years, I can at least get three babies out of them, right? On a good year, like on a good cycle, okay? That's probably not realistic because even the best breeding facilities struggle to get these animals to breed because of the fact that they don't like each other <laughs> in captivity very well. But they're also, it's very, it's a, it's a true science when we talk about breeding pandas, because they have a, really you're looking at 48 windows of when you can actually have a successful copulation and insemination of the female, that you're actually having to do all this hormonal analysis and you have to be on your A game with your labs, looking at fecal samples, looking at blood samples, looking at behavior, correlating all these things, and making your best predictive analysis of when you can put those animals together, when they're gonna have the best likelihood of breeding, and then when you have to pull them apart, because when she gets done with estrus, she'll start attacking that male and won't tolerate you know, them being together. What also often happens is that the fact that these animals actually don't understand how to reproduce in captivity. Um, and one of the things that they're finding is they're looking at how wild pandas breed, and what they're finding is essentially there's a single female with a whole line of males behind her, and it takes that many attempts to actually get her pregnant. Um, and so when you have them in captivity, 
usually the only way that you're going to guarantee successful insemination is actually through artificial insemination. It's not even through natural breeding. You're actually going to have to do medical procedures to get the animal to actually be artificially inseminated. Um, and that's where Smithsonian really leaves the efforts. They're, they're truly the pioneer and leader in that technology. Um, and, but as far as just standard breeding, so if we look at like Memphis and Atlanta, they can do that. It's expensive. Um, and so you have to kind of go into that. There's also a lot of conversations about do we want to be breeding right now because of the extra cost that goes back to China, right? There's a lot of conversations on the geopolitical sphere of how much of that money do we want to send back. This money is also advertised as a conservation donation as far as the, the panda birth, right? That's actually what they consider to be a conservation fee. But that $1 million per animal doesn't, or per pair of the bears, doesn't necessarily have to go conservation. The state of China can use that money for what it would like to. Um, so it's another way for them to kind of generate different revenue. Typically it's advertised a good chunk of that does go to conservation support and for mitigating different things and agriculture mitigation and stuff. Um, but there's obviously no way to track that. Um, and there's a lot of conversations in the sphere about, about the realities of that as well. Mm -hmm.